Welcome to episode 29 of the Total Hockey Training Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Scahan. And before we introduce my next guest, as always, Total Hockey Training, the online program, is in full swing. We're about to end the off-season program and head into the preseason. So, again, if you're a player, you're watching this and you need a training program, no matter where you are in the world, log on and we'll get you going. My next guest is no one other than Leanne Blinn. Leanne is the Director of Olympic Sports at Arizona State University. She has 20-plus years of experience as a strength coach, athletic trainer, a business owner, and an international competitor. She is the head strength and conditioning coach for men's hockey and women's soccer at ASU. Also, she's a 14-time USA Powerlifting drug-free national champion. She's also the world record holder for bench and deadlift total. Wow. Leanne, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. It's awesome to see you. It's It's been a yeah, while. It's been a long time. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. How did you – tell us about how you became a strength and conditioning coach. Oh, God. It's uh... – I'm going on year 28 as a strength coach. Wow. Like, this is kind of scary. This is yeah. really scary. I feel <laughs> old. Um, you know, I started the path of as an athletic trainer um, 28 years ago, 30 years ago. There really wasn't much in terms of strength conditioning or strength conditioning for football. And, you know, there was one strength coach on a staff. If that um, I did my undergrad at Endicott College in Miami, Ohio, and I met Dan Dalrymple at Miami, Ohio. And uh, I was an athletic training major. I hung out with Dan for a bit. I worked with swimming and he's like, hey, you want to write programs for the swim program? And uh, I'm like, yeah, this is kind of cool. So Dan kind of gave my first go at um, at strength conditioning at the collegiate uh, level as an intern. And I loved it from there. Uh, I became certified as an athletic trainer, but I kind of decided that I wanted to make things happen rather than sit around and wait for things to happen. And that's kind of how I say I got into strength conditioning. Um, for me, it's about go, 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 having, you know, having fun, getting stronger. I love the gym. I got in the gym when I was 13 years old and that's when I started, uh, started training and I trained for field hockey and softball. I played in college. So it was kind of an early, early road path for me, understanding about performance and, uh, you know, injury mitigation and things like that. So I here love I am it. 28 years later. <laughs> no, that's great for you. And I had a previous guest on Anthony Donskoff. Yeah, and he also mentioned Coach Dalrymple as well. How he played at Miami of Ohio as a hockey player, and he got into strength coaching around his tutelage, I should say. So that's yep. pretty neat. And I remember seeing Dan give a presentation at an NSCA conference a long time ago, and it was about his hockey program, and that kind of ignited my fire um, to work in hockey too, as well. So that's pretty cool. So yeah. talk about talk about some other mentors you might have had over the years. Uh, over the years, you know, honestly, it was hard um, getting into this profession. There weren't a lot of women in this profession, um, you know, so it was mostly male mentors, which is not a bad thing. It's a great thing. Uh, Joe Ken is one of them. House yeah. is, is awesome. Um, he's been really good to me over the years. Um, I've had an opportunity to meet with some great people. Um you know, Travis Mash has been awesome. Uh, Martin Rooney, uh, learned a lot from him on speed training when I worked at Parisi. There's, there's a lot of good, good strength coaches out there. Um, on the women's end, on the female side of it, um, Ray Ellsworth and I became really good friends. She was at Texas A&M, um, retired now. I think she's probably one of the first females to retire. Um, Catherine Koch is awesome um, out at Georgia. So we've kind of work together in, in terms of just uh, building a bond, not necessarily working together in, in physical presence, but just bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, Angie Brambley is another one. Um, there's so many other good, good women out there. Um, Mike Jones gave me my first opportunity to be a strength coach at Nevada Reno. Um, he, he, you know, he saw something in me when, you know, they didn't have a, they had a head strength coach position and then the first ever assistant position they had, he hired me um, and, you know, kind of gave me the reins to go with a lot of the teams and help out with football. And 
and everything at Nevada. Mike Poitamani, you you yeah. you know Poitamani well. Um, I still Coach talk P. to him. yeah Coach P. I talk to him quite often. Um, so there, there's there's a lot of really good people um, out there that I've learned from. Rich McClure gave me my first GA position um, at NAU, and I learned a lot about Olympic lifting back then. So it, it was it's it's kind of been a progress progression over time, learning about different things and learning about training, different training styles. So um, I love it. Mentors, yeah. That's awesome. And so let's talk about, let's talk about hockey. You know, you're the hockey strength and conditioning coach at Arizona state, which is now a member of the NCDC, if I'm not mistaken, which is, that's a pretty big deal. Um, a lot of strong and physical teams in that conference. So talk about that transition as far as your hockey training philosophy and your culture and, and you know what do you got going on there with the sun devils you know it's been an awesome ride for me um you know going to the nchc and seeing the program that has been built from being an independent i got here in 2018 and they had already been a d1 program for for a year or two mm -hmm. uh, at that point they turned uh it was 2015 is when they made the made the announcement that they were going to go from club into d1 and coach powers here has built a, an unbelievable program um we have a brand new rink here a brand new arena that opened up two years ago um you know they came coach powers talks about be the tradition all the time and and talks about um just the program itself and and being we, we had a lot of founding fathers basically that came in and, and built the program from scratch and and they got their asses handed to them a lot in the beginning. And then it's it's been growing ever since this year. They had an unbelievable year last year in the as an independent, 24, 9, and, and 6 um, as an independent, just missed out on uh, an at-large at bid, um, mm -hmm. their wise spots. Um, but culture-wise, it's an unbelievable culture. Um, I come from a mindset that you, you work your ass off and everything is earned. Um, and I bring that every day to the guys that are here. Um and I think for me, um, my background is being a competitive lifter, a competitive powerlifter, playing at the high school and college level, not necessarily in hockey. Um, I understand what it's like to be a collegiate athlete, understand what it's you know like to be under pressure, the you know, the agony of defeat and the the excitement of of winning um as a powerlifter for USA powerlifting and, and competing for 20 years. Um, and, and just doing what it takes. Um, so our culture is pretty strong. We have a, a great leadership crew of our upperclassmen. And, uh, and our freshmen def definitely understand that they have to, they have to earn everything. We had a 6 a.m. Yeah. workout this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Day after 4th of July. Yeah, there you go. The boys. <laughs> yeah. Well, is that also um, because of where you are? Is that weather dependent? Because I know, I mean, it's hot in Minnesota right now. So if it's hot in Minnesota, it's going to be scorching in Arizona. As I was just in Las Vegas last week and it was 105. So do you have to plan workouts around the heat where you're at? Yes. When it comes to conditioning and doing running outside, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's really hard here. You have to get guys to acclimate. Um, it's not easy to acclimate if you're coming from, you know, Europe overseas and, you know, have to deal with it's today's supposed to be 116 degrees. Wow. So, so it, it is hot. Um, a lot of it though, our workouts are set in the morning because we skate, they have open ice, um, like okay. nine fifteen to 11, they're on the ice. So we'll do our lifting beforehand. Um, I bring the freshmen in, the freshmen come in, they come at 6 a.m. And I make them, hey, you guys are coming in, working out, and then your asses better go and get breakfast. And then mm -hmm. I want a picture of your breakfast sent to me before I will let you in this arena to go skate. Um, so a lot of it's like, you know, teaching them things that they need to know, you know, being responsible and accountable and mommy and daddy or your billet family is not there to feed you anymore. You got to figure mm -hmm. it out. Um, you got to figure it out and go eat. So and they come no. back. Get yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And do the freshmen get to train with the upperclassmen or is that they something will. that, okay. They will. I do. They're on ice with the upperclassmen. Okay. Um, the freshmen, I usually bring them in first and kind of see what they know, what their background is. Um, as you know, owning your own spot, you know, training mm -hmm. age is way different. Um, even being in, at the NHL level, being at the pro level, mm -hmm. your training age has been different. If they haven't gone to college, your training age in the weight room is typically pretty low. Um, 
you know, for us, our training age has been kind of all over the map. Like our freshman class this year and last year, they were pretty dialed. Everyone in juniors now has a strength coach. The parents understand the importance of training and starting training and not just being sport specific. You know, mm-hmm. I got to do more skills, do more skills. Um, even when I own my business back in, in Massachusetts, ABT, I would hear from parents all the time, like, oh, more skills. I got to sign my kid up for, you know, this class and that class and this skills and this clinic. And it's like, yeah. how about, how about learn the fundamentals of getting stronger, getting faster, being more explosive, a little bit more on ice. Um, you know, there's a, there's a time and place for everything. Um, but I think sometimes parents miss the boat when it comes to, this aspect of training it has a huge impact or even cross training or even being a multi-sport athlete i see so many kids just specialize in one sport and they don't they developmentally they're so far i don't want to say so far behind but they're much more behind developmentally in in multiple different ways when you're not a multi-sport athlete look when you're 13 14 you know hey i'm gonna go play hockey gonna go play baseball i get it specialized but when you're you know five six seven eight years old like yeah let them let them go out and play let them go out and play let them let them go roll in the dirt a little bit you know right like get your hands on. dirty, right? Get your hands dirty. Drink out of a hose, you know. <laughs> <laughs> go go ride a bike without a helmet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Maybe not wear a seatbelt in the back seat. I, I don't. <laughs> maybe that's kind of stupid, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> but but um, no, I hear you on that. I work with lots of hockey players, and it's they just play hockey, and it's crazy how much other things they have going on at a time when they should be or i should say they've been told to get faster and stronger by their coaches whatever but they're still on the ice five or six times a week and what i when i get kind of frustrated with is when it impairs their ability to get stronger and faster it's a little bit too much and it's it's a tough conversation because there's a there's the fear of missing out factor. There is the the pressure. Oh, I need to go skate because so and so skating. It's it's hard and it's and it's trickling down to the younger ages as well. And that's scary, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I had a parent of an eight year old tell me come in and tell me, um, yeah, my kid's gonna be the next Tiger Woods. I need private one on one training for him. Like, how about let your kid like join a group, you know, my speed group and let, let them have some like play fun type, you know, type stuff. Yeah. Get them into some movement, movement patterns and then get them into slip, but one-on-one training for when it comes to developmental stuff, you don't need one-on-one training for an eight-year-old. No. Um, And and I've seen sadly so many athletes burn out by the time they're, they get to high school. I mean, 75% of kids drop, drop out of organized sports by the time they get to high school. It's crazy. The numbers because Still burnt out from it. Yeah, and I, and I just want to say, and I agree with. I would rather have a kid join a group than yep. have him be one on one because I think, from a social aspect and not necessarily competitiveness, but just being around other kids who maybe they work harder than that kid. Maybe that maybe that kid that their parents want one-on-one training. Maybe he doesn't have a work ethic and the parents think they do, but the kid doesn't know. And so it's like, you get into a group situation and it's like, okay, wow, this, these guys are working hard. This, these girls are working hard, whatever. So maybe I need to up my work ethic, something like that, or just from a technical standpoint as well. You know, yep. I, I do that all the time. Or used to like, I never wanted one-on-ones when I own my business. I, I always want, I would rather have, Hey, two or three guys, you know, a group of six, um, because they compete against each other. They learn mm-hmm. how to, compete. They, they learn how to work together. They learn how to push each other as a teammate. Um, sometimes I think, you know, kids, they, they don't want to push or they don't know how to push or they don't know how to feel uncomfortable or gets outside of their comfort zone. Right. Um, so used to being told how good they are, how great they are, they are, even now that the, well, now we see it with the transfer portal and NIL, but mm-hmm. the high school level, 
or club, I should say club or junior level, it's like, well, I'm not getting enough playing time. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave this one and, and go to this other, you know, this other club or go to this other junior team or go to, and they just, they never learn how to fight or deal with adversity and their parents kind of enable them the fact like, okay, I'm going to move you to this one. Cause you're going to get more playing time, even though it's a, a level below. Um, but it's like, how about let your kids, you know, learn a little bit, develop, deal with adversity, be, ha, you know, learn with how to deal being, deal with being told no once in your life. Yeah. And, you know, a, a lot of kids aren't like, they're used to always being told yes, or you're the best, you're the greatest. And what happens when guys get to college, they have no idea. They're a little fish in a big pond. When they get to college, they're recruited. They're told, Hey, yeah, you know, you're going to be this, you're going to be that we project you at this, but if you don't put out you're you're not gonna oh, be yeah. that. They don't right. know how to do it. So then it's like, oh, transfer portal, I'm out. Like, you yeah, know, coach give me what I want, and it's the coach's fault. Well, it's not really necessarily coach's fault. You gotta put a little effort into it, a little work into it. Yeah, I agree with that 100 percent And that's a great point. Um, all right, talk about I just remember uh, I remember being on a road trip a long time ago when I worked for the ducks and I put the TV on at like three in the morning, I think in like Edmonton or something. And I go on ESPN and I see you, I think you were like squatting a Mack truck or something like that. Tell, <laughs> t- tell us, tell everyone about, you know, your background in training and, and, you know, all that, the world's strongest women. And, you know, talk about your journey in powerlifting. And also what I'm interested in knowing is what do your athletes think about that? Are they intimidated are they scared are they motivated to to work hard so get into all that if you could um you know first of all my athletes know I'm a funny asshole um um, no I think I think they respect it um to some degree I don't think they understand it um my first my first uh experience so let's see back in 1996 yes I I'm dating myself I went, I was working at Nevada, Reno, and at the same time I was competing in powerlifting and football went to a bowl game and it was, their bowl game was actually in Las Vegas. And at the same time I had my national championships in Vegas. So I drove down separately and went and did my national championships, ended up with a couple of world records, like six big ass trophies that I, you mm-hmm. know, I won at this meet and I had just started to work with football. like uh four months ago or four months earlier and we had the bowl game and i flew back on the plane with them on the charter plane and i'm like carrying all these trophies and the guys are like what the hell is that what the hell <laughs> what, what did you do and then because i'm i was pretty like you know quiet about it like not you know just kind of unassuming um and uh and i'm like yeah i just you know did nationals just one one nationals and now i'm going to to cape town and um and south africa to compete for the u.s team and after that, guys were like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> um, you know, even when I was in grad school, Coach Axman, our football coach, would come in. I trained fo- the football guys. And then I train after the football guys were done. And he came up to me one day and he's like, I need a linebacker. Um, can I suit you up? <laughs> I'm like, okay, coach, let's go. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so, it, you know, it started. And back then, you know, again, there are not a lot of women in the profession. So it's kind of a new thing for for guys to see, um, for athletes to see, and for coaches to see um, strong women and, and um, you know, having an influence in, in the strength conditioning world. Um, from there, I, from Nevada, I competed, um, I competed at, uh, you know, worlds and nationals, all that. I went to Boston College. Um, I met a few strongman competitors uh, when I was at Boston, in Boston College. So mm-hmm. I got to Boston College in 1999. I met Art McDermott, met Charles Poliquin. Mm-hmm. Um, we held a clinic at Boston College with yeah. Charles. Quinn. I remember that. It was yep. awesome. We did uh, a grip strength deal, and and I'm going. It's the the hubcap pinch grip. So I'm sitting there going, and and I'm like the last three standing as far as the strength goes on the hubcap. And he's like, "What the hell?" So it, it was kind of it was just kind of fun, and I think I embarrassed a few guys along the way. Um, <laughs> But that was kind of a little bit of an intro to strongman. Um, you know, Bruce Tessier was a, a strongman competitor. He oh, got yeah. me 
So Bruce was awesome. He's like, hey, come try the stones at my house. And and uh, kind of took me under his wing, strapped me up to uh, to a truck to pull a truck for the first time. And again, this is back in 99, 2000, way back. And I'm like, hey, this is kind of fun. And I'm out in his, in his uh, uh, barn and he's got the Atlas stones. And he's like, hey, put this sticky stuff on your forearm. So I'm putting all this sticky <laughs> So I'm picking up these Atlas stones and throwing them up. Like, you know, we're going from, you know, 120, 140, 160, 180, and just, just keep going. He's like, it's like, you need to compete. He's like, you're, you're pretty strong in this. And I'm like, yeah, why not? So <laughs> um, I just kept competing and kept training. And then 2003, I made it to world's strongest woman. So um, it, it was, it was pretty cool. I went to South Africa, um, Zambia, South Africa, competed with some of the strongest women in the world. Um, you know, it, Jill Mills was like the, the icon world strongest woman. She competed in 2001, 2002. And, um, and then I had my turn in 2003, um, along with Jen Aylward and, uh, some for two of us were the U S competitors and I ended up fifth. So I, I did pretty good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> some of the best in the world but um yeah i got i got a lot of the same like same calls like what the hell it's three o'clock in the morning you're on tv <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember that it was yeah. insane yeah. i'm like what the yeah, yeah that, that's um that's so cool and are you still competing in powerlifting and or i retired online? so i retired in 2018 um i left the strong woman scene in about 2009 still kind of dabbled in powerlifting back and forth, came back to powerlifting, kind of cross powerlifting and strongman from 2005 or 2004, and then all the way to 2018. So I had a great run, great career, um, four-time world champion, IPF world champion, uh, 21 world records over my career. Uh, best squat was 545, best bench was 424, best deadlift 502. Um, oh. Went to world games my last world games in 2017 i had a bronze finish um podium finish so world games like the two heavyweight classes they do at body weight versus weight lifted um so it, it's that's uh, awesome had an unbelievable career like i couldn't i miss it like i retired i'm kind of you know you're my husband was kind of like all right you want to go out on a high note you finished on an unbelievable high note all these you know career accolades and everything and it was it was time it was time to kind of um, shut it down. So <laughs> I retired. But I think there's things uh, that your athletes can pick up from everything, right? That you, all that competitiveness spirit and all that. Hang on one sec. I'm sorry. No problem. In the training. Shit. Someone got hurt. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. No worries. In, in the training. In the training. Where are they? I don't know. Yeah, right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> oh, good. You are. You're okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I know I'm gonna cut this out. <laughs> no, no, no. If if, if you got to run, you got to run. I get that. Um. No. So, do your athletes pick up on all that, all those things that you did over your over your career, and they are? Do they know about it? Do you? I'm sure you don't brag about it, but I'm sure they're pretty impressed with all your accolades. They, they know. I mean, they like I said, I don't like I don't brag about it. I don't really talk about it. But a lot of guys like all say, Hey, you know, reaching out to freshmen and, and just talking about, Hey, what we need to do as far as coming in as freshmen and they'll end up like YouTubing or the upperclassmen will tell them <laughs> like, Hey, uh, you better YouTube Leanne and, uh, <laughs> what she's about. but, um, you know, That's for good. me, it's different. Like it's lifting is lifting. Playing is playing house is said it all the time. Um, in, in terms of like guys lift to, to get stronger, but you know, it, it's different playing. Um, my best lifters aren't my best, my, technically my best players and my best players aren't technically my best lifters. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just different. And even for me, like I retired three years ago or four years ago. Now I took up playing, playing hockey, never had skates on in my life. And now I play beer league hockey for fun. And awesome. Good for you. Yeah. It's put myself out there and the guys like it from a standpoint of it's putting myself out there, um, in a vulnerable position, doing what they do, even though I'm never going to be good as good at them as they are. But at the same time, like, Hey, I, you know, I'm putting on the skates and going, you know, going to play and they all know, I always tell them, I'm like, I have no skill, but I have all fuck you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, all I, right. <laughs> that's all good. You, you know, oh, uh, that's, that's good. You know. I, um, I also did pick up hockey when I worked for Anaheim back in the day. Yeah, and, and, and I felt 
probably like 2008 I picked it up and then I was skating with injured guys and they were giving me you know help and then I joined an adult league and I loved it and it also helped me kind of you know learn the game a little bit more yep. and and the positional play and all that and and also to understand what these players are, are going through um not yep. at that you know, not none of the intensity I was playing at or is, yeah, is uh, slugging along. But um, yeah, I thought that was beneficial. And it's funny when I went to Minnesota, it was awesome playing pickup hockey, adult hockey in Anaheim because, you know, it's a lot different than Minnesota. When I played adult hockey in Minnesota, I probably played three or four times. And these guys think that they're, you know, playing for game seven of the Stanley Cup final yep. and and I'm like, uh, uh-uh, I just want to, you know, get a workout in and get my heart rate up. And then working for the wild wasn't really too, you know, it, it, when I, when I played hockey, it was a way for me to get away from work where in Minnesota, they wanted to know about players. They wanted to talk about the team. And I'm like, I just want to, you know, get a workout in. So I don't, I, I think I kind of retired from pickup hockey. So. <laughs> so. Yeah. I go play a couple of days a week just for fun. And it's like, usually like a bunch of older guys like that have really good skill but they're not fast so yeah you know and they put up with me so um i'm usually the only girl out there that's awesome i, I bet your players respect that too i'm doing a clinic with johnny walker this afternoon okay <laughs> so we're gonna go out there and have some fun and like i have a slap like i have a slap shot like i can do a one-timer i get i can really? rip a slap shot. i have zero hands when it comes to <laughs> It's, yeah, it, I'm a disaster. I'm a disaster. No, that's that's funny. That that's great. So, you know, how's how's it going out there? You guys like it out there? And you, do you see yourself at ASU for a long period of time? Yeah, I mean, I love my job. I have a great job. Coach Powers is awesome to me. Um, in terms of it's it's a good spot. Um, I, I foresee myself staying here for a while. Um, mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. believe I'm going on year seven actually. So this is year seven with the program. Um, and it's, it's been fun, like starting from in this profession of being at Boston college, I had 22 sports. I had, you know, worked oh, yeah. men's basketball. I traveled and then at 22 sports uh, on top of it that you had to work with granted back in the, back in the day, strength conditioning was a little bit different where your priority was in the weight room. You didn't do all the stuff you do now in terms of speed conditioning. Usually the coaches kind of took care of that at BC. Yeah. Um, now that you know the the profession has changed uh, the profession has changed significantly i have 10 staff members on my staff and for me yeah. i now we have hockey so you right know, soccer, i've been able to to have um laura take on women's soccer for me uh women's basketball abby only does women's basketball men's basketball hunter does men's basketball and triathlon um everyone has like two and three sports and that then that's it so mm-hmm. our our profession has grown uh, significantly in terms of, um, you know, having having more to do with each sport as opposed to just being a weight room guy. Kind of. Yeah, I, I remember that vividly at Boston College. We had 33 sports. Coach P was football and me and you split up the rest. Yeah. And I, I think it was they had like we had like tiers back then. Right. You had football men's women's basketball and men's hockey they got they got you know everything and then you know we had the other sports i I hate to say it but those coaches that knew that were awesome like i remember pete hughes the baseball coach just so appreciative of getting his team in there and you had some other coaches who were you know, well, why do they get to come in and, and, and do speed and agility training or whatever it was at the time? And because we had 33 sports and it, it, you know, I was traveling with women's basketball and men's hockey, which are both in the same season. season. And it was, uh, it was a whirlwind. And, you know, it's, it's crazy it, thinking about Boston College. My son is going to be a freshman there next year. And oh, that's awesome. Man, he just got drafted. Just got drafted, which is really cool. That's but he's awesome. gonna he's gonna be a, a freshman there, and Russ is still the hockey strength and conditioning coach, which is yep. pretty cool. And yep, uh, time. yeah, and that's pretty neat. And I think that staff has expanded um, quite a bit, quite a bit. So 
Yeah, like, yeah, that's that's what it was. We had it was TAs and everything there. Now we had interns. Like we had interns. We had, yeah, we had interns. No conditioning was. And, and one of them was this kid, um, Jimmy Arthur, and he has been in the NFL for years now. Um, he used to come down. He used to drive down from Springfield College once a once a, a week. Yep. And he, he was awesome. Now he's been like the head strength coach for the a few NFL teams now for about probably like fifteen years. Which th- that's pretty neat, you know. And yeah, it's um, but it was you, you got experience coaching there because uh, you know, as you, as I said, a lot now, thirty three teams and it, it made it me was, a better coach. I would never trade 100%. it. Like now nowadays, it, it's so different. Our profession has changed. I think sometimes for the better, but sometimes for the worse. Um, I don't think. I don't think upcomer kids now in this profession have a coach's eye like we did back in the day. Mm-hmm. I think I can look at something or look at an athlete and say, Hey, this is going on. This is going on. Granted, I've been in it for 28 years. I don't need a force plate to tell me that. So right. it's technology yeah. validates, validates what I already know. And I think in this profession now, strength, coach, strength coaches or upcoming strength coaches, all they do is rely on science and data and to tell them, to tell them what to think or what to say. And I don't know, yeah. maybe, maybe I'm old school, but I am, I'm very much a, you know, coaches, hands-on coach and, and, and talking to and connecting with, with student athletes and players and asking them, Hey, how do you feel? I don't need a force plate to tell me how you feel. And half these kids don't jump when they're supposed to jump anyway. You right. know, there's, oh, I got to do this. And I just got to do this, you know, and then a strength coach, Oh yeah. Are you not feeling good? Are you not feeling good? I just didn't feel like jumping today. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. nothing to do with it. I like I got a good game to go play or I got practice going and I know it's gonna be hard. I just didn't feel like jumping today. So but you're gonna get on me and tell me that, hey, my my force plate number's down. What's going on? You're all concerned when I really didn't give two shits about the force plate. I don't care. It's nothing to do with hockey. Right. So. Uh, you know what? I agree with that because I've had some other conversations with on other shows about that specific topic. And yeah, you you know, I remember giving a presentation years ago and it was uh, in Boston actually. And a gentleman asked me, Hey, how do you monitor? And I was like, I think that the crowd was waiting for me to say some, you know, Oh, I use a mega wave or I use force plates or something like that. And it was, I talked to him, I, I listened to him and guys, people were scratching their heads like what do you mean i'm like i'm like well yeah i have a conversation with them and see how they're feeling and i think that goes a long way versus like you said getting guys to jump and i remember in 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 the professional ranks you know guys didn't necessarily want to jump that day or they didn't want they did they forgot to and i think we're in a situation now where coaching is a lost art it's more of analyzing data and it's it's I don't know it's it's not necessarily the direction I think this profession should be going in. It should be a people based profession, and like you said, that coach's eye I think is very important. And I think it's it's I don't know if, if it's going that way. Would you agree with that? Or I definitely agree with that. I I think the art of coaching is is a dying breed. I, I really do, sadly. Um, and mm-hmm. I think brought back because I think you know connecting with a student athlete, collaborating with a coach, um, communicating, learning how to communicate. All these kids have had different people work with them over their year, over the years. Like you have to be able to communicate with them. But if you communication is, is basically just me spewing stuff at you. If you don't connect with that kid or know how to have a conversation with that kid, they're never going to, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. Yeah. So you know, and, and for me, like our guys here know that I'm going to push them hard. They know that I'm going to make them feel uncomfortable. But like I told our freshman that came in, like, I will never ask you to do something that I don't think you can do. Like you may in your mind think like, no, I can't do that. I can't lift that. Or I can't, you know, I can't run that. I'm like, I will never ask you to do that. And I said, that's my promise to you. I will never ask you to do something that I don't think you can do. And you know, programming, I tried over the years, I've tried everything that I've ever done for for our athletes, you know, mm-hmm. put different programs together. And, and I think now it, that's even lost. I, I, I don't think um, some of these up and comers don't, unless you come in from like Springfield college, the Mecca of strength conditioning, you know, MK, yeah. 
done a really good job in hands-on type stuff. I think some of these programs, they they don't do a good enough job developing um, their interns or their up-and-comer GAs. Um, like I even feel bad for our GAs here. They don't get as much hands-on experience because every coach has to have a full-timer. So our GAs assist everything, but our GAs never get the opportunity to have to deal with adversity with a coach or deal oh, yeah. with you know, a tough situation or to deal with a kid that says, yeah, I don't feel like doing that today. Or right. I mean, back in the day, what do we used to do? A guy comes in, you know, 21 years year old comes in hungover. All right, go on the, you know, put a weight vest on, go on the stair climber, <laughs> yeah. you know, sweat it or out. Lord. Or they're late for the workout. Or they're or late for the God workout. forbid they're late for workout. Like that was, that was yeah. the kiss of death. <laughs> if you were late that for a be. workout. <laughs> You know, nowadays you can't punish kids. You can't punish kids with exercise. And it's, you know, it's, it's, how do you hold yeah. them accountable? You yeah. know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. No, it's, it's crazy. I can only imagine. Um, with, yeah, with, with my own business, if someone's late, I'm like, okay, just jump in the warm up. You know, I'm, I don't get mad if, 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 you know, their parents are stuck in traffic trying to get them trying to go from work to home to pick them up, to bring them to the gym, you know? So it's, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, and I tell our guys here, I'm like, Hey, I don't get mad. I get even. Yeah. <laughs> they look at me like, what does that mean? I'm like, I don't get mad. I get even like, I like, I, yell and scream. I mean, my last time of yelling and scream was probably at the days of Boston college when yeah. we had freshman football players being morons. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's But nowadays it's like, you know what? Hey, I'll, 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 I'll get, I'll get mine, you know? Yeah. And, and no, that's you'll... great. That's so. awesome. Well, Hey Leanne, this has been phenomenal. It's been great catching up with you and great to see you. Um, we'll wrap this up, but any, anything else you want to share with the, the, the community here? No, I think, um, you know, as far as strength conditioning, you know, coaches keep doing what you're doing, keep get, making athletes better, keep getting them stronger and faster and, you know, and understand why we do this, you know, we, yeah. It's, great profession it's um you know you get to get to help kids along the way get to coach some great ones um for me i don't care whether you're the first one off the bench the last one off the bench um i'm always going to coach you and put as much effort into you as, as you put into me um and i think awesome. that sometimes our coaches you know in this profession they're like oh well this guy's going big time that guy's going to be big time and and it's like you know sometimes the kids that that aren't the big time or you what you think is big time needs the most help um, it's going to help you out in the long run. That's a great point. I like, I love that. So how could listeners, um, if they want to reach out to you or are you on social media or anything like that? I used to be on social media till my Facebook got hacked. Oh. <laughs> it's kind of said ass through it. Um, I am on like Twitter and, um, <laughs> Twitter and, uh, Instagram. I don't okay. post a lot. I'm usually pretty quiet, but if anyone ever wants to chat or, you know, ask about training programming or anything, you can always email me at, uh, lblin at asu.edu. I'm always happy to, you know, answer any questions and if anyone yeah. wants to sit down and train and hang out and, you know, see what we do. I'm, I'm happy to have visitors too. So that's awesome. Cause you never know, there could be a, a female coach out there who aspires to be someone like you. You know, and I don't look at it like male, female, but you know, but like it's, it's pretty neat what you're doing. So that's really. Cool. I love my job. I love my awesome. job. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, and uh, me. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. All right. See ya. All right. Thanks. Bye, Leanne. Bye.